हाय फ्रेंड्स गुड इवनिंग चलो सो द एजेंडा फॉर दिस वीडियो वी आर टू कवर एग्रीकल्चर इनकम प्रिटी सिंपल प्रिटी स्मॉल एंड वी आर गोइंग टू कवर वन ऑफ द सिंपलेस्ट हेड्स ऑफ इनकम इनकम फ्रॉम अदर सोर्सेस एग्रीकल्चर इनकम वेरी स्मॉल वेरी इजी टू टैकल देर आर टू थिंग्स इंपॉर्टेंट टू स्टडी इन एग्रीकल्चर इनकम वन हाउ डज इट अफेक्ट अवर इनकम टैक्स कैलकुलेशन एंड सेकेंड द कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ कंपोजिट इनकम इट विल कम अप इन योर पेपर्स एज वन एडजस्टमेंट इन अज क्वेश्चन द चैप्टर इज वे टू स्मॉल टू बी आस्ट इंडिपेंडेंटली हाँ बट दिस चैप्टर अफेक्ट्स योर इनकम टैक्स कैलकुलेशन दिस चैप्टर अफेक्ट्स द वे इन विच वी कैलकुलेट अवर टैक्स एज पर स्लैब रेट्स स्लैब रेट्स डोंट चेंज बट द वे इन विच यू कैलकुलेट योर टैक्स दैट मेथड विल चेंज वेरी स्मॉल मे बी रिवाइजिंग इट माइट टेक अबाउट फिफ्टीन ट्वेंटी मिनट्स मे बी हाफ एन आवर एग्रीकल्चर इनकम इज कवर्ड बाय सेक्शन नंबर टेन टेन वन एग्रीकल्चर इनकम एग्जैम्ड यू डोंट पे टैक्स ऑन एग्रीकल्चर इनकम ऑल द टैक्स पेयर्स ऑल सेवन पर्सनस enjoy this exemption that means agriculture income will not be included in the five heads gross total income agriculture income will not be included in the total income it is completely exempt from income tax and this exemption is available to all the seven assessees that we have all the seven persons ha huh. the point to remember is Agriculture income earned in India is exempt. So, if you earn agriculture income outside India, no exemption is available. Then the agriculture income outside India will become taxable. Only if you earn agriculture income in India, that is where you get an exemption. <coughs> Sorry. Now, how does it affect our tax working? So, there is something called as scheme of partial integration that applies if scheme of partial integration applies it means our first amount the amount of basic tax will undergo a change now the basic tax will be calculated as per a three step formula <coughs> sorry you have these three conditions these are conditions for applicability of this scheme of partial integration whether these conditions are satisfied or not agriculture income remains exempt from tax these three conditions are for that scheme these three conditions are to calculate your basic tax in a slightly different manner condition number 1 you must be a person who pays tax according to slab rates which means you must be an individual huf aop boi artificial juridical person but obvious it means a partnership form a local authority and a company for them this scheme of partial integration that we are studying is not applicable they will enjoy their exemption of agriculture income but their income tax calculation will be done normally their income tax calculation will not be done according to this scheme second condition the assessee that we are talking about has total income which is greater than the basic exemption limit total income means the non agricultural income apart from agriculture whatever income you derive under all the five heads minus your chapter 6a deduction the final amount the taxable amount total income that should be greater than the basic exemption limit but of course if it's greater than basic exemption limit only then tax is supposed to be paid and your agriculture income should be greater than 5000 if all these three conditions are satisfied then you follow a three step formula what is my three step formula you take the amount of agriculture income you add the total income and consider that on this total what would be the amount of tax calculated as per slab rates apply the slab rates that are relevant for you senior citizen super senior citizen others category 
take your agriculture income, add the taxable income, total income and on that total that you get, apply your slab rates and calculate your tax amount. Step 2, take your agriculture income and add the basic exemption limit. So basically here if you understand what we have done is, we have done a total of all those incomes which are exempt. So now we are trying to figure out how much is the tax on such amount of income. So what is the tax which I am not supposed to pay which is not payable. Why is it not payable? Because the income is exempt. Even if you have 5 heads gross total income minus chapter 6 a deduction total income a certain amount of that total income is exempt because of basic exemption limit and agriculture income by default is exempt under section 10.1. So in step number 2 we are accumulating all those incomes which are exempted from tax and we are trying to find out what is the amount of tax that I am saving or what is the amount of tax that I am not supposed to pay because of this exemption. So I will get some amount rupees so much and then the last step is take the amount of tax that I have calculated at point A, subtract the amount of tax that I have calculated at point B. This amount, this is the basic amount of tax payable. From this, we will subtract rebate under section 87A wherever rebate situation arises. We will add surcharge if surcharge is applicable we will add 4% health education says and this will be the final tax liability. So if you have agriculture income above 5000, if you are an assessee who pays, who pays tax according to slab rates and if your total income exceeds the basic exemption limit, if these three conditions are getting satisfied, then your basic tax working will be done in this manner. What will happen is the effect of this is agriculture income will push your total income, your taxable income into a higher slab. So you will not pay income tax on agriculture income, but you will pay income tax on your non-agricultural income at a higher rate than what you would have normally paid. So directly agriculture income is not subject to tax, but on the non-agriculture income on my other incomes from the five heads instead of applying a tax rate of say 5%, I am applying a tax rate of 20% or 30% because of this scheme, I will push the non-agricultural income into a higher slab. This scheme is applicable only for assessees who are going to pay tax according to slab rates. So if you are going to pay tax according to a flat rate that we just saw from company local authority, for them this scheme does not apply. Agriculture income exempt, F heads of income, total gross total income, chapter 6 a deduction, total income taxable. And on this straight away apply your flat rate of tax and calculate your tax. So for assessees paying tax as per flat rates, the scheme of partial integration will not apply. Agriculture income will continue to be exempt and on the total income they will pay tax as per a flat rate. Our budget has introduced a new section, section 115 BAC. Section 115 BAC is talking about concessional slab rates. But of course concessional slab rates is for your taxable income, for your total income, for your non-agricultural income. So an individual who is opting for this concessional slab rate can still pay tax, can still have agriculture income. So this scheme of partial integration will still be applicable to such an individual who is earning income according to, uh, sorry, who is paying tax according to the concessional rate, but is wanting to opt, uh, but is also having agriculture income and is wanting to opt for 115 BAC. Now what will happen is, that the basic exemption limit in case of 115 BAC option is only 
a single basic exemption limit of 250000 irrespective of your age irrespective of your residential status you just get one basic exemption limit of 250 and but of course these slab rates that i am talking about they will be the 115 bac slab rates that means the concessional slab rates so there is no change at all it is just a clarification if an individual or huf is having agriculture income and wants to go for the option of 115 bac the scheme of partial integration will still apply if those three conditions are satisfied but in the calculation we have to take care that irrespective of the age irrespective of the residential status there is a single slab rate 250000 is a basic exemption limit and those concessional slab rates will apply the method will still work exactly the way it is working so this is your scheme of partial integration which affects your income tax calculation many a times in your compulsory question where the question will tell you give you information about various heads give you information about chapter 6a deduction and will tell you compute total income one of the adjustments will be agriculture income now we got to pay attention that generally the moment we see agriculture income in the sum we will say this is exempt but if the question is also asking you compute income tax liability then you have to keep in mind that agriculture income of an individual greater than 5000 is going to change your tax calculation because this scheme of partial integration is going to apply and so you will have to do the working as per the scheme step 1 step 2 step 3 should be a separate working note and in that working note you should find out the basic tax then take the basic tax into the main solution and finish your answer so just keep in mind if the question is asking you total income and tax liability and one of the incomes given is agriculture income it is always advisable to check whether these three conditions are satisfied or not and if they are calculate your tax as per the scheme Chalo. second important concept from an examination perspective composite income what do i mean by the word composite the word composite means combined so i am earning combined income which means i am earning agriculture income also and i am earning business income also and how are they connected to each other in your business activity you need agricultural products as raw material now as a businessman if i require agriculture product as my raw material i would go to the agriculture market purchase the raw material and then use it in my business activities but here the stuff is slightly different here what is being imagined is that yes i require agricultural product as a raw material but instead of going to the agriculture market and purchasing the product purchasing the agriculture goods i am myself cultivating it if the assessee himself cultivates the agriculture product the moment he cultivates the agriculture product he will earn agriculture income then that agriculture product will be transferred into business activity obviously it's my agriculture activity and my business activity so i'm not going to pay anything to myself but that means that i am doing some activity which is agriculture which will generate income which is exempt and my balance activity is business which is going to generate income which is taxable so i am doing a composite activity which is giving me composite income i cannot pay tax on the entire amount the income has to be split into two parts the income will have to be split into two parts because a certain part will be agriculture income that will be exempt a certain part will be business income only that business component will be taxable so what is the need to split into two parts because i am earning combined income and a certain part is exempt and a certain part is taxable how do i split it so for tea coffee and rubber as the agriculture product income tax act has given me a simple formula a simple table calculate your profit and divide that profit into business income and agriculture income if i am into coffee which is only grown and cured 
then only 25% of the profit is business activity, balance 75% is agriculture. If I am into the product rubber, then now there are different qualities of rubber available in the rubber industry, latex, cinex, crepes, block rubbers. Okay, some type of rubbers are used in some uh, industry, some uh, products, the rubber used in different products will be different and eraser will have a different quality of rubber as compared to a tire. From an in income tax perspective, everything is rubber. And if an assessee is cultivating that rubber and is then using it in his business as raw material, 35% of his profit will be treated as business profit, 65% will be treated as agriculture income. If I am into the activity of tea, tea growing and manufacturing, 40% business profit, 60% agriculture income. If I am doing activity of coffee, but this time coffee is grown, cured, which is there in point 3 also, but now there is roasting, grounding, mixing. So, more business activities are done and therefore, business profit increases from 25 percent to 40 percent but obviously agriculture component will reduce so the method of remembering is actually quite simple for rubber 35 65 if coffee is only grown and cured it is 25.75 and I can remember that in all other cases the breakup given is 40.60. You can actually observe that in the table point number 1 and point number 4 have the same set of percentages. So then just remember the percentage for rubber. If coffee is only grown and cured 25.75, rubber 35.65, every other case of tea coffee rubber is 40.60. And the lower percentage 40, 25, 35 that is a business component. The higher percentage is the agriculture component. That means what will also mean is that this part, this will be treated as taxable. This will be taxable as profits and gains of business profession. Agriculture component, this entire component this will be exempt from tax section 10 1 that means this is not going to be included in gross total income only the business component will be taxed under pgbp and included in the gti the agriculture component will never be part of gti because it is exempt income this is in case of tea coffee and rubber all that i have to do is to just remember the percentages if i am talking about products other than tea coffee rubber say I am talking about orange, I am talking about tomatoes, I am talking about sugarcane, products other than agricultural products other than tea coffee rubber. Now, it is a slightly different formula to remember. When I do my calculation of agriculture income, whatever is the market value of that agriculture product, on the date it was transferred to the factory, this will be taken as my income this is profit and loss account credit side less the only expenditure which is allowed to be deducted is cultivation cost so that means this is PL debit side but of course you can understand that when I am talking PL debit PL credit I am talking about agricultural PL account a PL account that a farmer would prepare but here I am only the farmer and I am only the businessman so how do I split my income into two parts I am thinking that instead of transferring the agriculture product to the factory if I had gone to the market what income would I receive that is my PL credit minus the expenditure incurred for cultivation PL debit balance profit remaining this is my profit which is agriculture profit this is exempt under 10-1 then this same market value 
which we took as PNL credit for the farmer is now going to be taken as PNL debit when we do business calculation. As a businessman, instead of cultivating the agriculture product myself, if I would have gone into the agriculture market and purchased it, then I would have paid the market value. So that's my expense. Then the agriculture product is converted into the final product. Orange is converted into orange juice. Sugarcane is converted into sugar. Tomato is basic. Tomato is probably converted into ketchup. Then the cost of manufacturing, the cost of conversion, that is also going to be my expenditure. Other expenses incurred will be debited. Whatever is the sale or turnover, but obviously sale or turnover will not be of the agriculture product. Sale or turnover will be of the finished product. The finished product which is manufactured, which is developed using agriculture product as a raw material. So ketchup is my finished product, orange juice is my finished product, sugar made out of sugar cane. So sugar is my finished product. Sales minus these three expenses gives me business income. This is the business income which is taxable. Agriculture income will continue to remain exempt. It is this business income which will be taxable. So in the chapter of agriculture income, it is one of the easiest. It is one of the name. I would go to the extent of saying it is the easiest chapter. Just got to take care of these two things. One, how to how does agriculture income affect your tax calculation? So scheme of partial integration, the entire system needs to be remembered. And if by chance the question gives you a situation of composite income, then if it is tea coffee rubber, remember the percentages. And if it is any other product, this formula, which is not something great, you don't need to rotate it by heart. You can easily develop it logically. This is your agriculture income. Chalo. Now, let's get into our heads of income discussion. The first head of income that I'm taking up is actually in sequence the last head of income, income from other sources. Something way too simple, something way too easy. So let's start discussing IFOS as a head of income. Now why is this head of income so simple? The head of income is simple primarily because the method of calculation of income is a very simple calculation. Income minus expenses. It's a very small head of income. It's a very short head of income because you don't have many sections. And the formula is also very easy. Take the incomes under the head IFOS, subtract the expenses that are allowed as a deduction. Received or receivable, paid or payable. This indicates that income from other sources is going to be computed according to the method of accounting followed by the assessee. 9 out of 10 questions, you will not be given the method of accounting. So the default method of accounting that we all know is your accrual system. If the question tells you that so and so is the method of accounting, then go ahead follow that method. But Majority sums will never tell you what the head of income, or what method of accounting is followed by the assessee. So by default, we follow the accrual system. Figure out the income taxable under IFOS. Reduce the expenses that are incurred. Balance amount is taxable. The important sections are number one, section number 56. That section 56 is important because of the charging section. Section 222 which defines the term dividend that is important and in in section 56 we have a discussion of 56 to 10 that is an in-depth discussion that is important everything else is pretty simple pretty easy to manage nothing nothing difficult nothing great charging section 56 now section 56 gets divided into two parts 56 1 Subsection 1 is the general subsection. General subsection, what does this general subsection say? It simply says one thing. If the income is taxable, that means it is not covered by section number 10. There is no exemption allowed. But the income cannot be covered 
under the first four heads of income. Then it will be covered under this last head, income from other sources. This is how we generally understand the term IFOS. It is a residuary kind of a head. It is a balance. Balance incomes are covered under the head IFOS. So there is nothing great in 56.1. 56.2 is called as a specific subsection because the incomes which are covered in 56.2 are always going to be taxed as income from other sources, always. The charging section of other sources has specifically mentioned or covered these incomes and therefore you will tax it as IFOS only. This is a list of about 11 incomes. Some of them are, some of them are way too simple, way too easy. Some of them are such that we might have to talk a bit in detail. Dividend income. A major amendment introduced in dividend that dividend distribution tax has been abolished. So dividend income will be taxable for the receiver. I say receiver because I am talking about shareholder, mutual fund, unit holder, everybody is covered. Dividend income henceforth will be taxable for the person who receives, not the person who pays. Companies, mutual funds, they earlier used to pay dividend distribution tax. Now they are not going to pay any dividend distribution tax. Dividend income will be taxable for the shareholder, for the unit holder. The important part to understand is, whether the shares are held as investment or a stock in trade, it does not matter. Dividend is always going to be taxed as income from other sources. For dividend income, the head is always IFOS. If I am holding my shares as stock in trade, then the profit that I get will be taxed under the head PGBP and if I hold the shares as an investment, that means as a capital asset, then from investment whatever profit I get is going to be taxed as capital gains. So the profit is taxable either as PGBP or as capital gains depending on how I hold the shares. But dividend is an income earned by the share holder, the holder of the share. For dividend, it does not make a difference whether it is held as stock or whether it is held as investment. Dividend is always going to be taxed as income from other sources. Something more on dividend later on in the lecture where we observe the amendments and we see the definition. As of now, we just come to the conclusion that dividend will always be subject to tax under the head IFOS. Does not matter how the shares are held. Second income, very popularly known as winnings or as some people say casual winnings, where your income depends on luck. So it is not a regular income. It is a casual income. It is not regular in nature. Any winnings that you get by way of lottery, puzzles, games, gambling, betting, all of this will be treated as income from other sources. Peculiar aspects to remember here, many things to remember. No expenses ever will be allowed as a deduction. If you win, that entire gross amount is taxable. If you do not win, then your income is zero for income tax purposes. Expenditure for casual winnings will never be allowed as a deduction. The entire amount, the full amount, the gross amount will be taxed. They will be taxed at a rate of 30% as per section 115 BB. No benefit of basic exemption limit. The maximum rate straight away 30% will apply. You cannot claim any chapter 6A deduction. You cannot set off any losses. So if you have a winnings income, this income under winnings always income from other sources at the gross amount and 
fully subject to tax without any reduction you cannot reduce this income by chapter 6a you cannot reduce this income by setting off on any loss with it you cannot reduce this by any basic exemption limit you will pay tax at the maximum rate of 30 percent there is no reduction permitted there is no reduction possible next income this is something that will come up in pgbp also remember it for theoretical purposes it there is a very less chance that you may get any question on it if at all you get any question it will be a small one mark or two mark of theory question where the situation is that when an employer will pay salary to his employees every month he will retain a certain portion of the employee's salary because the employee is supposed to give a contribution into the provident fund so this employee's contribution that is supposed to be made into the provident fund is retained by employer <coughs> sorry employer keeps this money with himself and he is supposed to deposit this money into the provident fund on or before the due date mentioned by the fund so whatever amount has been retained by employer that is income whatever is deposited that is an expense balance amount remaining is taxable now if the employer is involved in pgbp activities it is taxable under the head pgbp but if the employer is not doing pgbp activities for example a charitable organization then it will be income from other sources under which this taxable component will be brought to tax employer retains something from the employee salary take it as his income if it is pgbp it is charging section 28 if it is ifos it is charging section 56 then whatever amount is deposited by the employer into the fund on or before the due date of the fund that will be subtracted as an expense pgbp section 3615a ifos section 56 balance remaining will be subject to tax next income interest income now here it says interest on securities if held as investment and not held as stock in trade that means if my securities are held as stock in trade and they are earning interest income so interest lending borrowing is my main activity then the head of income will be income from business profession pgbp so for interest income it is either ifos or pgbp 10 15 minutes ago we saw something like dividend but dividend whether stock in trade or investment is always ifos interest can be either ifos or pgbp depending on how the securities are held next income now what i am earning are higher charges in simple language i am earning rent but i am not earning rent from a property rent from a building rent from a property will be taxed as house property i am earning rent from plant machine furniture which means i can say i am earning this rent from other assets not from building so if a property is giving me rent income it is house property income if other assets are giving me rent income then it is ifos income ha huh. the charging section of ifos tells you that if it is not chargeable to tax under the head pgbp then it is taxable as ifos which implies that if i am talking about other assets rented out and if they are rented out as a regular activity then the head is pgvp if they are rented out as a one-time activity 
then the head of income will be IFRS. So it is not always IFRS. IFRS will come into picture if it is not taxed under PGBP. So if you give out machine furniture on rent on a regular basis, that is your main activity, that income is taxed as PGBP. But if it is not your main activity and you've just done a one-off transaction, then the head of income applicable will be IFRS. The next income is also rent income, but here it says composite rent, meaning I am giving on rent building plus other assets, which I was doing earlier also. So what is the difference here? The difference here is that building plus other assets, the transaction is an inseparable transaction. Letting out of building is inseparable from the letting out of these other assets. Owner wants to give everything on rent together. It is not possible to split building and other assets. You cannot take only the other assets on rent. You cannot take only the building on rent. If you are taking it on rent as a tenant, you have to take everything together. So now house property as a head of income will never apply this composite rent will never be taxed under the head house property because the rent amount charge is a combined rent amount which does not include anything separately for house property it is a combined figure now if this composite rent activity is regular in nature it will be pgbp and if it is a one time transaction then it will be income from other sources but house property as a head of income will not apply if the transactions can be separated, then house property, separate, other assets, either PGBP or IFRS. If the transaction cannot be separated, then house property never applies. Then it is either PGBP or IFRS. Both are rent incomes, but the important thing to observe is, can you give one on rent without the other? If yes, that means they are separate transactions. Then house property for building for other assets, PGBP or IFRS. But if you cannot give them on rent separately, they are combined, they are part of a single transaction. No house property, either PGBP or IFRS. Chalo. Going ahead, key man insurance policy. Amount received from key man insurance policy is always charged to tax. You may remember this small provision. Maybe that amount received from a life insurance policy is exempt. Section 10, clause number 10D. Key man insurance policy is a life insurance policy definitely, but it is an exception to section 10, 10D. That means as far as key man insurance policy is concerned, no exemption is available, taxable. Now, depending on who receives it, the head of income keeps on changing. Employee receives it, salary. Employer receives it, PGBP. Any other person receives it. Other person itself indicates that I am talking about income from other sources. So, if the person take, receiving the money is any other person, other than employee, other than employer, then income from other sources will apply. Next. Important can come up as a small adjustment. Very popularly, it is called as securities premium. Although this heading might be a slightly misleading type of a heading. So do not just focus on the heading. Securities premium is what is being taxed, but not always, not the entire securities premium. You have to listen, you have to look at a particular situation. This section, this particular uh, clause number 7b is applicable only in case of a private company, only in case of a closely held company, a private limited company. The person who is purchasing the share must be a resident person, only then this will apply. And you are issuing the shares at a premium, then whatever consideration is received, if it exceeds the fair market value, then the excess is taxable. So, 
in simple terms just a second in simple terms it will look something like this that it's not necessary that the entire premium will be taxable now if my face value of the share is 100 and they are issued at 170 there is definitely a premium of 70 rupees but if the fair market value is 160 rupees then over and above the market value you are recovering 10 rupees per share it is this 10 rupees per share which is going to become taxable but in the same example if I now discuss a situation where 100 rupees is the face value issued at 170 and the fair market value is 185. Now I am not taking money from the resident person more than the market value of the share. I am definitely taking a premium for my share but now nothing will be taxable because the consideration received is only 170 and the market value is 185 consideration is not exceeding market value then nothing is taxable see in the following cases 56 to 7b will not apply shares issued at a premium but equal to or less than fmb then nothing will be taxable shares issued by a public limited company nothing will be taxable this section is only applicable if a private limited company is going to issue shares and if shares are issued to a non-resident then also this provision will not apply even if they are issued by a closely held company but issued to a non-resident then this provision is not going to apply remember that the amount is taxable for the closely held company and not for the resident person the resident person is purchasing the share the closely held company is receiving money receiver of premium and it is the closely held company which is going to pay the tax not the shareholder moving ahead very simple income if you are going to get some compensation or enhanced compensation but this compensation is delayed and for the delay you are receiving interest then this interest is going to be taxed as income from other sources it is always going to be taxed in the year of receipt irrespective of the method of accounting we saw at the starting of the chapter that the method of accounting is important in ifos but this one income interest income will be taxed in the year in which it is received so if the delay is for three and a half years this interest income will be received for three and a half years but it will not be spread in your three years or four years ka return of income it will be brought to tax in that la year of receipt only next income if for a capital asset you are receiving some advance money but the deal did not happen and so the deal got cancelled and the advance money was forfeited who forfeited it but obviously it was forfeited by the owner of the capital asset the buyer gave the advance but then the deal got cancelled so the seller was not able to sell the property he he forfeits the advance money if this advance money is forfeited on or after 1st april 2014 then it is taxable as income from other sources because if the advance money is forfeited before 1st April 2014 under the chapter of capital gains it will be reduced from the cost of acquisition and you will not pay tax under IFOS. This provision of advance money forfeited was introduced in the 2014 budget therefore the date is 1-4-2014 and so as a student you will have to remember that if the advance money is forfeited on or after 1 4 1st april 2014 then and only then ifos ka head will apply of course clarification if it is forfeited on or after 1 4 2014 you are going to pay tax under the head ifos that means this will not be reduced from the cost of acquisition you cannot have double effect on or after 1 4 2014 pay tax under ifos before 1 4 2014 reduce it from the cost 
and the all important discussion section 56 to 10. Any sum of money or any property received received by any person all seven persons are covered during the previous year. Now this is a detailed provision there is a small amendment the amendment is actually an important one but not a difficult one. This is something that is in detail so please pay attention we are going to discuss this a lot 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 in depth not only because of the amendment but this is something that can come up in your exams also. Okay, so what exactly are we go going to study here? In 56 to 10, mm -hmm. the important point to keep in mind is that there is a giver, there is a receiver. The giver gives money this money is given for no consideration or the giver gives property now this property is of two types movable immovable and it is given in two ways there are two possibilities either given for no consideration or given for inadequate consideration and the same thing will equally apply to immovable properties also. Certain small small concepts if we keep in mind then understanding the provision becomes very easy. Concept number one it is the receiver for whom this section will apply 56 to 10 is from the receivers perspective number one number two we will also study the stuff from the givers angle that if the giver does this transaction what will happen for the giver but our focus primarily under IFOS discussion will be from the receiver's perspective. All seven persons are covered here. Originally when the section was introduced it was meant only for individuals and in HUF. Thereafter the scope was expanded and today companies, firms, AOP, everybody is covered by this section. This property that we are talking of, this word property, this should be a capital asset. The word property should fit in the definition of capital asset. And when you say movable and immovable, there is a defined list. Every movable capital asset, every immovable capital asset is covered. Nay, there is a set list, there is a defined list. It should be a capital asset and it should be these capital assets only. Immovable property covers land building both. Shares and securities. So when I say securities, I cover debentures, bonds, mutual fund units, everything gets covered. Jewelry, archaeological collections, drawings, paintings, sculpture, work of art, all bullion, all of these are covered by the section. So, what is not covered by the section? Something like depreciable assets. Depreciable assets are definitely capital assets. But for depreciable assets, 56 to 10 is not applicable personal assets like motor car they are not a capital asset only because they are personal in nature they are not a capital asset so motor car is not covered by 56 to 10 depreciable asset is a capital asset but it's not covered in the list so 56 to 10 is not applicable personal assets 
56 to 10 does not apply depreciable assets 56 to 10 does not apply so you have to be accurate enough and remember that it is only these assets which are covered by 56 to 10 now let's see what the provision is very simple sum of money somebody is giving me money for no consideration free of cost that means i am receiving money as gift if the total amount received exceeds 50000 then the total amount is taxable so things are done or calculation is done on an aggregate basis and not on an individual basis i may receive 10000 rupees from seven people so 70000 is the amount taxable if the total amount received is less than 50000 or equal to 50000 then nothing is taxable so calculations are going to be done here on an aggregate basis sum of money this is the simple provision then we go to movable property now movable property gets divided into two parts received for no consideration received for inadequate consideration so one thing at a time received for no consideration if the total market value even here things are on a total basis i receive four movable properties four different shares or one share one debenture one jewelry i have to do my calculations on total basis if it is received for no consideration and the total fmv exceeds 50000 then it is a total fmv taxable but if the total fair market value is up to 50000 nothing is taxable this is everything that we are focusing on currently is from the receiver's angle first we will study everything from the receiver's angle and then we will go into the discussion of what happens to the giver if movable property is received for inadequate consideration that means it the receiver is actually purchasing the property he is paying some consideration he is purchasing it that means there is some consideration now let us find out total fmv minus total consideration if you understand this concept it means we are trying to find out the inadequate component market value was 10 lakhs but i paid only 7 lakhs so how much inadequate 10 minus 7 3 if that inadequate component is greater than 50000 then that part is taxable total fmv minus total consideration is taxable but if the inadequate component is up to 50000 then nothing will be taxable so for the receiver if he receives movable property and does not pay anything then the total market value above 50000 the total amount taxable that is a concept of no consideration inadequate consideration means he is receiving movable property but he is paying something but what he is paying is much much lesser than the market value then how much inadequate if that inadequate portion is greater than 50000 then that entire inadequate component is taxable as ifs up to 50000 everything is exempt now you go to the concept of immovable property again your received for no consideration stamp duty value greater than 50000 the entire stamp duty value is taxable here it is on an individual basis and not on an aggregate basis for movable property it was on an aggregate basis sum of money was also on an aggregate basis total basis but immovable property you check one transaction each transaction will be checked separately no totaling will be done sdv greater than 50000 sdv is taxable stamp duty value less than equal to 50000 nothing is taxable if it is received for inadequate consideration that means the receiver of the property is paying money that means the receiver of property is actually purchasing is actually buying the property 
now sdv minus consideration this means this is the inadequate component if this is greater than prescribed amount so what is the prescribed amount this is the prescribed amount 50000 a standard amount or 10% of the consideration whichever is higher if the inadequate component is greater than this prescribed amount then sdv minus consideration the entire inadequate component will be taxable just to give you a small numeric example if the consideration is 100 lakhs 1 crore and the stamp duty value is 175 lakhs that means for a property whose market value is 175 lakhs the buyer is only paying 100 lakhs there is an inadequate component of 75 lakhs now 10% of the consideration it means 10 lakhs standard amount in the section 50000 out of the two whichever is higher is the prescribed amount 10 lakhs is the prescribed amount is 75 lakhs greater than 10 lakhs definitely yes then under the head income from other sources the entire 75 lakhs will be charged to tax for the buyer it is very easy to understand why such a provision is created property transactions have a lot of black money involved so if a property has stamp duty value of 175 lakhs but consideration is only 100 lakhs that implies that this 100 lakhs is the white payment and 75 lakhs is the black payment so the buyer is dealing in black buyer is paying black money we are going to tax him on this inadequate component but if in this very example i make the stamp duty value as suppose 104 lakhs i make the stamp duty value as 104 lakhs so the inadequate component is only 4 lakh rupees now is 4 lakhs greater than the prescribed amount no then the concept of ifos will not apply nothing will be taxable if the SDV minus consideration, look at this. If the SDV minus consideration is less than or equal to the prescribed amount, nothing is taxable. So you can understand that a margin of 10% of the consideration is given. If the inadequate component is up to 10% of the consideration, IFOS is not applicable for the buyer. The moment the inadequate component exceeds this 10% of consideration, the entire inadequate part will be taxable for the buyer. Now this is all from the buyer's perspective. Now receiver's perspective basically what I mean. Now let us look at everything from the giver's angle. From the giver's perspective. Sum of money received by someone for no consideration. So what about the payer? Pretty simple. For the payer, this is money gifted and money gifted is a capital expense and capital expenses are never allowed as any deduction. Revenue expenses ka deduction is allowed. So if you gift money to someone, it is a personal thing that you are doing. You cannot claim any deduction of this under any head. Movable property received for no consideration that means the giver has given the movable property without any consideration he is giving it free of cost that means for the giver this is a transaction of gift given so section 47 of capital gains is saying that nothing will be taxable if there is no consideration nothing will be taxable if the movable property is received for inadequate consideration that means the receiver is actually purchasing which means the giver is actually selling this movable property 
so the moment giver is going to sell i mean he's a seller seller that means the head of income applicable will be capital gains full value of consideration shall be the amount of actual consideration ha huh. if your movable property is unlisted shares then there is a separate section 50 ca according to 50 ca fair market value will be taken as your full value of consideration otherwise the actual amount will be taken for the seller immovable property received for no consideration that means as far as the giver is concerned he has gifted it free of cost no consideration to that receiver so for him nothing is taxable under capital gains but if it is received for inadequate consideration that means if the receiver is actually purchasing it it means the giver is actually selling it now there is section 50c created 50c is saying that the stamp duty value will be taken as full value of consideration even in section 50c even in section 50c for the seller the 10% margin is available ifos is from the buyer's angle 50c is from the seller's angle if the f full value of consideration is within that 10% margin then you will not take stamp duty value you will take the amount of consideration only i am pretty sure you remember this and if not when we do the revision of capital gains we will see the similar provision applicable from the seller's perspective last point to study here observe something ha huh. this might help you understand for the person who is receiving the capital asset please remember now i am using the word capital asset so i am talking about movable property and immovable property both for the receiver of the capital asset if this ifos provision got attracted then he has already paid tax under ifos what has become taxable the fmv has become taxable the stamp duty value has become taxable now that fmv that stamp duty value will be taken as cost when this receiver subsequently is going to sell this asset in future the cost of acquisition will be the fmv or sdv that was taken into consideration that was taken into account for finding this 56210 taxable amount so when i received the asset i paid tax under 56210 now when i will further sell it whatever fmv sdv has become taxable will now be my cost for determining long term short term we need to check holding period holding period will not will not include holding period of the previous owner that means holding period will will be your own exclusive holding period indexation in case of long term will be allowed only for your own holding period you've held it for 24 25 26 months you will get indexation benefit for that period only this is when ifos becomes taxable now what if ifos does not become taxable if ifos does not become taxable that means you have not paid tax on fmv or sdv now but you have received it free of cost for no consideration then cost of the previous owner will be your cost cost of the previous owner in simple terms means the giver of the capital asset whatever was his cost of acquisition will become your cost now even his holding period will get included if we follow the bombay high court judgment of cit versus manjula j sha indexation will be allowed for the entire holding period total holding period including your own holding period and the holding period of your previous owner but if that bombay high court judgment is not followed then it will be holding period of the previous owner that means you will have to present two alternatives in your solution of capital gains institute also does the same gives you two solutions one as per the bombay high court judgment the other without bombay high court judgment you don't need to solve the question twice you can just write a small note this is 
visualizing a scenario where the giver gave the asset to the receiver but at the time of receiving the asset ifs did not apply and then the receiver subsequently sold it so there was one mr x who gave the asset to ronak but for ronak ifs did not apply now when i ronak will sell it in future to somebody else capital gains will apply at that point of time cost of mr x will be taken as cost of ronak x ka holding period will also be included in ronak ka holding period if manjula j shah bombay high court judgment is followed indexation will be allowed to ronak starting from x ka holding period otherwise indexation will be allowed to me only for my holding period if the asset is received for inadequate consideration and ifos is not taxable that means now x sold the asset to ronak ronak paid the consideration but did not pay tax under 56 to 10 now i have paid some consideration so the actual cost paid by me will be my cost of acquisition in future i will not take cost to previous owner mr x now i have paid something that is my actual cost only my holding period will be covered previous owner mr x ka holding period is not included indexation will be allowed to me only for my own holding period not for the holding period of mr x so this is a summary from the receiver's perspective for the receiver this is what going to happen this is what is going to happen one small point to remember here it will come up in small adjustments there are certain exceptions created or certain exemptions that are allowed in 56 to 10 saying that if the receiver receives the movable immovable property money in these situations then 56 to 10 will not apply received from any relative if the individual is getting married and he is receiving immovable movable property if he is receiving it as per will so his father his mother is leaving behind something as will then as a receiver whatever i receive even if the market value is above 50000 not subject to tax in contemplation of death of the payer or donor the person who is about to die instead of giving the asset as per will is immediately transferring the asset before death still exemption is available to the receiver of the asset local authority income exempt under 1020 fund foundation hospital university medical institution exempt under 1023 c charitable trust registered under 12 a income is exempt under section 11 these three they are the givers if they give money if they give property it is basically to help someone financial assistance then the person who is receiving the financial assistance is not going to be told to pay tax charitable organizations generally give this benefit paying fees for poor children or paying the medical treatment of poor people this can be done by uh, various funds foundations local authorities also so the person who is receiving the money the monetary assistance the benefit ifs provision will not apply to them if partition happens by a member of huf on partition of the huf then when an huf is partitioned and asset is given to the member for the member this will be exempt this market value of the asset received will be received free of cost no consideration if my huf gets partitioned and i receive something i am not paying anything to the huf it is because of partition that i am receiving the amount receiving the money receiving the property nothing will be taxable if a trust is receiving something from an individual so there is an individual who is transferring money or asset to the trust but this transfer is made for the benefit of the relative of the individual so this is actually if you understand this is point number i is the indirect version of point a instead of giving the asset to my own relative i am giving the asset to the trust and i am telling the trust you 
use this asset for the benefit of my relative indirectly benefit is going to the relative so if point a is exempt then this indirect version point i is also going to be exempt relative world has been defined spouse brother of the individual sister of the individual brother of the spouse of the individual sister of the spouse of individual brother of either of the parents sister of either of the parents lineal ascendant lineal descendant of the individual lineal ascendant lineal descendant of the spouse of the individual and their spouses so spouse of this sister spouse of the brother spouse of the brother or sister i am the individual my spouse my spouse's brother and that brother's spouse is also covered as a relative my father my mother will be my father my mother will be covered in point 5 my father in law mother in law will be covered in point 6 my maternal uncle paternal uncle maternal aunt paternal aunt will all be covered in point 4 these are all relatives if i receive anything from them then for me it is completely exempt a small notification was issued by the government and in one of the revision test papers institute had included this notification for your study you can keep this in your mind just for theory purposes in the area of delhi and gurgaon somewhere uh, on the outskirts etc uh, ncr national capital region of delhi there were many unauthorized colonies set up by the builders unauthorized meaning they did not take permission from the local authority they just constructed everything they sold the property to the to various individuals general public now government had no choice but to give that permission convert it from unauthorized to authorized you cannot demolish that property uh, people are staying there staying there since a long time it was a builder's fault that he did something illegal but then the people who purchased the property purchased it in good faith so what happened was government passed a notification in the year 2008 march 2008 a notification was passed and everything that was unauthorized was given regularization was given permission okay you will be now treated as legal authorized obviously on the day when it became authorized the market value would be much much more as compared to the actual amount at which it was purchased it was purchased 6 7 years ago at a nominal price it was considered legal and authorized in future or today let us say for example today the market value is 1 crore when it became regular or authorized but when you purchased it it was purchased maybe let us say for 30 lakhs now 30 lakhs is the consideration market value is 1 crore 70 lakhs inadequate so then government came out with this notification saying that the provisions of 56 to 10 shall not apply as per this notification wherever this unauthorized colony in delhi has become authorized and you are a resident person meaning you have physical possession of the property on the basis of a sale deed power of attorney agreement to sell will possession letter my father purchased it gave it to me as per will even i am covered by this section i purchased it myself i am covered by this section ha huh. tenant licensees and permissive users they are not included so you may be in physical possession of the property but you are not the owner then this provision is not applicable to you anyways this notification is giving a benefit that 56 to 10 will not apply to you when the government makes it legal and there is a difference between market value on that date and the amount that you paid then this provision will not apply very rare that this can come up in your paper just go through it once and keep it at the back of your mind so that if there is a small theory question you might be able to answer it but chances are very rare that you can have this in your paper so this is your 56 to 10 56 to 10 in a quick summary i can say it talks about money movable property immovable property there is a threshold created of 50000 rupees for immovable property it is 50000 or 10% of the consideration if your 
मार्केट वैल्यू स्टेम ड्यूटी वैल्यू इनएडिकुएट कंपोनेंट एक्सीड्स फिफ्टी थाउजेंड देन दैट अमाउंट बिकम्स टैक्सीबल फॉर द रिसीवर सर्टन केसेस एग्जामेशन इज गिवन रिलेटिव ओकेजन ऑफ मैरिज विल इनहेरिटेंस रिसीव्ड ऑन पार्टीशन सो इफ यू फॉल इन दोज एग्जामेशन कैटेगरी देन आई एफ एस प्रोविजन विल नॉट अप्लाई टू यू आई दिस कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ आई एफ एस इज फ्रॉम द रिसीवर्स परस्पेक्टिव इफ द रिसीवर इज ऑलरेडी पेड इनकम टैक्स अंडर फिफ्टी सिक्स टू टेन वेन ई हेज रिसीव द प्रॉपर्टी देन लेटर ऑन वेन ही सेल्स इट एंड इट इज कवर्ड अंडर कैपिटल गेन्स टूडे द एफ एम वी टूडे द एच डी वी दैट वॉज टेकन फॉर पेइंग टैक्स अंडर फिफ्टी सिक्स टू टेन दैट एफ एम वी दैट एच डी वी विल नाउ बी टेकन एज योर कॉस्ट ऑफ एक्विजिशन ये फिफ्टी सिक्स टू टेन डिड नॉट अप्लाई देन कॉस्ट टू प्रीवियस ओनर और द अमाउंट ऑफ एक्चुअल कॉस्ट दैट यू हैड पेड डिपेंडिंग ऑन द सिचुएशन विल बी टेकन एज योर कॉस्ट ऑफ एक्विजिशन इन फ्यूचर चलो दिस इज योर फिफ्टी सिक्स टू टेन मूविंग अहेड देर वॉज अ स्मॉल अमाइंडमेंट ऑफ टेन परसेंट बाकी एवरीथिंग वॉज प्रिटी सिंपल स्ट्रेट फॉरवर्ड यूर कमिंग टू द सेकेंड अमेंडमेंट ऑफ योर चैप्टर ऑफ आई एफ एस डिविडेंड इनकम एज आई ऑलरेडी टोल्ड यू डिविडेंड डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन टैक्स हैज बीन अबॉलिश्ड सेक्शन टेन थर्टी फोर टेन थर्टी फाइव एग्जामेशन सेक्शन आर ऑल्सो अबॉलिश्ड डिविडेंड इनकम विल बी टैक्सीबल हु कैन गिव यू डिविडेंड इनकम नंबर वन Domestic company can give you dividend income. Foreign company can give you dividend income. Mutual fund can give you dividend income. Cooperative societies can give you dividend income. Today everything is taxable, whether you receive it from a company as a shareholder, mutual fund as a unit holder, cooperative society as a member. Everything will be brought to tax. Dividend income will be taxable, taxable under the head IFOs. there is also an amendment in section number 57 expenses which are allowed as a deduction the amendment is very easy to remember the only expense that is allowed is interest expense which means if you have taken a loan to invest into shares and you are paying interest on that loan this is the only expenditure which is allowed as a deduction no other expenditure will be allowed as a deduction to the shareholder shareholder unit holder everyone that too the restriction put is 20% of the dividend income will be the maximum deduction possible meaning if my dividend income is 100 rupees and the interest expense is 17 rupees then 17 will be subtracted and 83 will be taxable but by chance my dividend income is 100 and the interest expense is 24 then as per the section 24 will not be allowed as a deduction only 20 will be allowed 80 rupees will become taxable so maximum deduction possible is 20% of the dividend income and that to only interest expenditure is allowed other expenses given in the question we will have to ignore them then there is one section section 115 bbd here if an indian company is receiving dividend income from a foreign company so foreign company is the payer of dividend indian company is the receiver of dividend 26% or more should be the voting power then this dividend will be taxed at the rate of 15% that means the regular rate of tax of 25% or 30% that will not apply to the indian company on this dividend income indian company will pay tax at the rate of 15% ha huh. expenditure not allowed as a deduction the entire amount of dividend will be subject to tax this dividend should be dividend under 222a to 222d so in a way this section can be understood as four conditions number 1 the payer is a foreign company number 2 the receiver the shareholder is an indian company 
नंबर थ्री द टाइप ऑफ डिविडेंड इज टू ट्वेंटी टू ए टू डी एंड नंबर फोर द वोटिंग पावर शुड बी मिनिमम ट्वेंटी सिक्स परसेंट इफ ऑल दीज फोर कंडीशन आर गेटिंग सेटिस्फाइड देन एंड ओनली देन वन वन फाइव बी बी डी विल अप्लाई अ स्पेशल इनकम टैक्स रेट ऑफ फिफ्टीन परसेंट नो एक्सपेंस इज अलाउड इन द फॉलोइंग केसेज वन वन फाइव बी बी डी विल नॉट अप्लाई दो फोर कंडीशन आई जस्ट नेगेटेड दम दो फोर कंडीशन दैट आई जस्ट रोट वेर फॉर एप्लीकेबिलिटी ऑफ वन वन फाइव बी बी डी दीज आर द फोर थिंग्स दीज आर द सिचुएशन वेर वन वन फाइव बी बी डी विल नॉट अप्लाई इफ वन वन फाइव बी बी डी इज नॉट एप्लीकेबल एक्सपेंसिज विल बी अलाउड एज अ डिडक्शन एंड नॉर्मल रेट ऑफ टैक्स विल अप्लाई वन वन फाइव बी बी डी इज अ सेक्शन ओनली एप्लीकेबल टू इंडियन कंपनी एज अ शेयर होल्डर इंडिविजुअल पार्टनरशिप फॉर्म इफ दे आर शेयर होल्डर्स देन वन वन फाइव बी बी डी विल नॉट अप्लाई डिविडेंड इज डिफाइंड इन सेक्शन टू सबसेक्शन ट्वेंटी टू क्लॉज नंबर ए टू क्लॉज नंबर ई सिंपल डेफिनेशन नथिंग ग्रेट टू ट्वेंटी टू ए is the normal meaning of the term dividend when you pay dividend company pays dividend in monetary form so the bank balance of the company comes down and reserves come down reserves are reduced and bank balance is reduced so assets of the company are released to the shareholder accumulated profits are distributed and they are distributed in the normal sense by making monetary payment so 222 a is the normal meaning of the term dividend which means i am talking about interim dividend or final dividend in section 222 a 222 b today does not happen in the olden days it used to happen that the company would distribute debentures free of cost to the shareholders this would be a case of free issue of debentures today no company is doing this everybody is just making monetary payment but in the olden days dividend used to be paid in the form of debentures so income tax act said even this is treated as dividend because you are paying it out of accumulated profits and to the preference shareholder not every shareholder preference shareholder bonus shares were being given bonus shares if bonus shares were given to equity shareholders it shall not be treated as dividend only to preference shareholder if bonus shares were given then it was treated as dividend so for simplicity i can write down if bonus equity shares were given to equity shareholders or bonus preference shares were given to equity shareholders this is not not treated as dividend but if bonus equity share or bonus preference share is given to a preference shareholder then yes this is treated as dividend by this what i am trying to explain to you guys is what is important is the type of the shareholder what type of shares are given irrelevant if the shareholder is equity shareholder then dividend ka ye definition this definition does not apply only if the shareholder is a preference shareholder then whether the shares given are equity or preference it does not matter bonus shares given to preference shareholder this is treated as dividend again today no company is actually doing it if you have to distribute dividend rather than giving bonus shares and affecting the market value affecting the earning per share number of shares affecting all of that rather than give paying dividend like this companies are paying dividend in monetary form monetary form of dividend which will mean 222a in the olden days 222b used to happen so therefore it is there in the definition 222c if the company is undergoing liquidation and at the time of liquidation if profits are distributed 
then that is treated as dividend so what will happen is working will be done for the shareholder amount of money received add anything received in kind if the company has given anything for the uh, anything in kind that will be totaled then whatever is the accumulated profits of the company multiplied by the shareholders share in it this much will be treated as dividend and will be reduced from the working balance that is remaining this is full value of consideration now you do your capital gain working and this is taxable remember something we know the amendment that dividend is also now becoming taxable for the shareholder so this amount that i have just highlighted this is taxable for shareholder this final answer capital gain is also taxable for shareholder then what is the difference the difference is dividend is taxable for the shareholder as income from other sources this is taxable for the shareholder the difference final answer is taxable for the shareholder under capital gains so head of income is different whatever you receive as final settlement amount from the company includes a certain component of your share of profits share of profits given to shareholder means dividend dividend means ifos separate it out only the balance will be taken for capital gain purposes and that balance will be full value of consideration then you do your capital gain working so both these amounts are taxable dividend and capital gains but the head of income is different point d again something very rarely done if the company undertakes reduction of its capital internal reconstruction and it distributes profits then this is treated as dividend buyback is not covered here because for buyback we will study in the chapter of capital gains separate provisions so buyback is not included in the definition of dividend internal reconstruction is an example of 222d but internal reconstruction generally is done of sick companies sick companies are anyways loss making companies so the question of accumulated profits does not arise only but a very rare situation in the past when the company had profits if some profits were transferred to general reserve and now on reduction of capital on internal reconstruction those reserves are distributed to shareholder then 222d will come into picture and it will be taxable for shareholder as dividend income very rarely possible 222e this is important dividend definition but observe some things carefully this section 222e says that the company which is paying the dividend should be a closely held company only private limited companies are covered in 222e public limited company is not covered in 222e definition shareholder that is covered should have a minimum 10% of voting power minimum 10% so if the voting power is less than 10% section will not apply you are talking about voting power so you are talking about equity shareholder if it's a preference shareholder section will not apply and the transaction that is happening is closely held company is giving a loan to the shareholder or closely held company is giving a loan to a concern in which the shareholder has substantial interest or closely held company is making some payment on behalf of the shareholder either ways a common thing i don't know if you can guess this but in all these three points you may you may understand that accumulated profits are directly or indirectly used for the shareholder that is becoming possible because the shareholder is having minimum 10% of voting power and is able to influence the company they are being used for the shareholder 
profits are indirectly being diverted to the shareholder being used for the benefit of the shareholder then such amount of loan or such amount of payment will be treated as your dividend income the loan given the advance given the payment made to the shareholder this will be compared with the amount of accumulated profits that the company has out of the two whichever is lower this will be treated as the dividend amount that is taxable this is your accurate formula for 222e taxable for the shareholder ha huh. a small exception if possible remember it otherwise it's fine if the company private limited company is into lending business borrowing and lending then giving loan is a normal part of business activity if lending is substantial part of business of the company then you cannot invoke 222e because it is doing normal business activity with the shareholder like it is doing with a stranger the intention of 222e is that the shareholder is misusing his voting power and taking a loan from the company but if giving loan is the business activity of the company then the section will not apply so that is a small exception where lending and borrowing is substantial part of business activity of the company then 222e will not be invoked 222e will be invoked in normal circumstances only these are the five types of dividend so dividend discussion comes to an end here simple thing ddt abolished taxable for the shareholder now it will be treated under ifos generally speaking normal tax rates will apply only interest expense will be allowed as a deduction that to 20% of dividend is a maximum amount allowed as a deduction 115 bbd is a specific situation if that gets attracted sorry if that gets attracted then 115 bbd will apply and instead of paying your regular tax of 25% or 30% you will pay only 15% tax on the gross amount of dividend without doing any deduction of expense and there are five types of dividend popular ones are 222a interim final 222c liquidation and 222e the last section that we study loan and advance reduction of capital debenture given free preference shareholder getting free shares theory purposes you remember it hardly ever happens in practical life so chances of b and d the second one and the fourth one coming in the paper are very less the first third and the fifth can still appear in your question paper second and fourth are very less we've done the discussion but less probability of coming in the paper 57 58 last two things remaining expenses allowed as a deduction to so bank charges commission collection charges they are allowed as a deduction for interest income if you give out assets on rent then on that asset repair expense insurance premium property taxes depreciation all that is allowed as a deduction if you are paying rent and earning rent subletting then that rent paid is also allowed as deduction if you are talking about family pension family pension is pension that is received by family member after the death of the employee then one third of the family pension subject to a maximum of 15000 is the standard deduction that is allowed at the beginning of the chapter we saw point number 4 employer is retaining something from the employee's salary as contributions whatever contributions are deposited on or before the due date of the fund only they will be subtracted as an expense also we saw that if you get interest on compensation it is always taxable in the year of receipt you will get a standard deduction of 50% that means the balance 50% of interest will be taxable and a general point any other expenditure incurred which is not capital in nature not personal in nature but it is for the purpose of earning ifos income will be allowed as a deduction we've already seen this amendment 
interest expenditure on that to only up to maximum 20 percent will be allowed expenses which are disallowed pretty much identical to our pgbp concepts personal expenses disallowed if you are paying interest to someone outside india and tds defaults have happened you have not deducted tax or you have deducted tax but not deposited that on time then the expense will be allowed this is for interest payable outside India, salary payable outside India. This is a common thing, TDS default. If you are paying something to a resident person and there is a TDS default, then 30% of that expense shall be disallowed. In future, if 30% has been disallowed today, and in future, if TDS is deposited, then the amount disallowed earlier shall be allowed as a deduction in the future year. If the receiver, who is the receiver? The resident person. If the receiver has on his own paid income tax, then such disallowance shall not be made. So, if you fail to deduct tax, failure to deduct tax, but if the receiver has paid the income tax from his own pocket, then for the payer expenditure will be allowed as a deduction. The 30% disallowance will not happen. Then provisions identical to PGBP, any payment made to relatives which is unreasonable will be disallowed. If you make a payment in excess of 10,000 rupees and you do not use the prescribed modes of payment, you use cash you use bearer check, you use crossed check, then all such payment made will be disallowed as an expense. It should be about 10,000 and the prohibited modes, these modes, let me write them properly. These are the prohibited modes of payment. You must not use these modes. If these prohibited modes are used and the amount is greater than 10,000, it will be disallowed. Income tax paid will not be allowed as a deduction. For winnings, we have already seen no expenditure ever will be allowed. We have already seen this point. 30% is a rate of tax applicable. No chapter 6 deduction, no set off of any loss, nothing doing. So, this is your chapter of IFOS. I am not going to go through the summary again, but just a small thing for you, for a study hint if I can say. In IFOS, there are two important things to study. Always ensure that you study those two things properly. 1, 56 to 10 and all the related sections, cost of acquisition, 49, 1, 49, 4, 56 to 10 and related sections, that is something important. Second, everything relating to dividend incomes, 115 BBD, definition of dividend, uh, what are the, what is the amendment in expenses allowed? Ensure that these things are properly discussed, properly understood, properly studied. Everything else in IFRS is not difficult at all. One reading and you should be comfortable with IFRS. It's absolutely fine. These are the two things where I would suggest that you study something in depth. You don't leave out anything. 56 to 10 has exemptions also. 56 to 10 has capital gain implications also. So, study these two topics in depth, balance things, even if you give a simple reading, you will be able to solve questions in your paper perfectly fine. Okay, chalo, so IFS comes to an end. We will continue with these videos tomorrow. Tomorrow, I will take up salary as a head of income and that will take up, that will be a substantial uh, chapter. So, we might split it into two videos, two parts. Tomorrow's agenda is to give you guys the revision of salary chapter. Okay, chalo. Happy studying. See you guys tomorrow. Goodbye.